Okay, so um, this month we're going to take a look at Clang tools that you can use from inside Visual Studio without having to purchase any additional uh, extensions or, or just what comes with Visual Studio out of the box. And the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, Clang format. So if you've ever had the dreaded white space argument on your team you know should it be tabs or should it be spaces and if it's going to be what's the indent level is going to be two or is it going to be four it's going to be eight whatever um, once you decide what you're going to use then you can get on to more productive discussions like the design of your code and how the interfaces should look and stuff like that and to keep your code formatted consistently you can use this tool from the Clang world called Clang Format and it's a tool that they created for themselves first so it has many uh, style options that you can set now but you may still find that some of your own personal style choices are not automated in this tool but it's open source so you can always hack the tool to um, support your particular settings and they basically have, let's see if I can find it here. Um, they have groups of settings that are categorized under a particular style. So they have predefined styles for LLVM, which is the style formatting that the LLVM tree, which includes Clang. That's what they prefer to use. The Google settings, uh, the settings for Chromium, Mozilla, WebKit, Microsoft, I assume, matches the default set of formattings for Visual Studio. And if you uh, want to make your own style, usually what people do is make a configuration file for client format that starts with somebody else's style and then you have your set of differences on top. Now, uh, Clang Format and all the Clang tools we're going to discuss this evening have um, evolved over time. So, the, uh, I, I'm looking at the Clang 11 documentation, uh, and that is because the Clang that is shipping with the current Visual Studio 2019 uh, latest update is version 11. So, uh, if you ever want to know, what version of tools you're getting with Visual Studio, you can go down to Visual Studio 2019 and then go to a developer command prompt. And if you pop that up and you can you can see in here that you've got a Clang format that comes from Visual Studio's installation location. And if you run Clang format dash dash version, you can see it says version 11.0.0. So that's how you can identify which version of the Clang tools you are getting with your version of Visual Studio. If you're using, they've, they've been bundling Clang Format and Clang Tidy and Clang Compiler with Visual Studio for a while. So if you're not on Visual Studio 2019, um, I, I don't recall off the top of my head what tools are supported uh, out of the box. You might have to install like a, you know, experimental feature from the Visual Studio installer but whatever is supported should be in your path from the Visual Studio developer command prompt and then you can um, <coughs> run dash dash version to see what you're getting. Now, um, as I say, there's lots of individual settings. You can see from where my little scroll bar thumb is that there's lots of settings on this page that determine all kinds of things. So if you're not happy with the styling that comes out of the box you can create a .clang format file. You put it in your source tree, commit it into version control, and then Visual Studio, when it invokes Clang format, it will get the settings from that file. And you can have, um, if for some reason you have multiple directories that have different style options, you can have multiple .clang format files, and the one that is 
you know, in the most, the nearest parent directory from whatever source file is being formatted, that's the one that will be used. So what, how does this look inside Visual Studio itself? So I've got here uh, this iterated dynamics project that I've got up on GitHub. It's an, an old dusty deck pile of code that is a fractal renderer. Here's, here's a little piece of code if I, you know, make this formatting all ugly. Um, we can even go like this and get rid of any optional white space. Let's just be really disgusting. Okay, so I can take that, highlight a section of code, and then I can say... I thought I had it on a context menu. I know I've got it bound to a keyboard shortcut. Oh, I bet it's up here. Edit. Uh, I thought I had it as a... I thought there was a menu item, but I got it bound to a, a keystroke, control K, control F. Um, hey, that didn't look right. It moved it around, but it didn't do what I was expecting. Let's try it like this. What does it do that? That's a little better. Uh, it seems to be not quite doing what I was expecting. Huh. See, before when I had it like this, it's always nice when your presentation gives you a surprise in the middle. When I had it like this, and I said format it, it just did the indenting as I was expecting. Uh, in this tree, I don't have a dot client format file, so it's using whatever the base formatting settings are. And how do you control that? Well, in tools options, down in the text editor for C++, you'll see down here code style, formatting. Now me, um, these are not the default Visual Studio settings. All these automatically do whatever are turned on by default in Visual Studio. Me personally, I don't like my code being formatted when I'm while I'm typing. If I want my code formatted, I will select it and invoke a formatting operation. Um, and the way you get Clang format support is you enable this checkbox. Normally this checkbox is off and it's just going to be formatting according to Visual Studio's formatting sensibilities, which is basically controlled by all these little options that you have down in here under formatting. Um, but what I do is I, uh, I turn off most of Visual Studio's automatic formatting, like automatic form formatting a block when I type closing brace, or automatically format a statement when I type a semicolon, etc. I turn all that off because that's just my personal preference. And then I enable Clang format support and I tell it to run a Clang format only when I manually invoke a formatting command. Um, and here they've chosen, I guess that when it said Microsoft over on that documentation page, it must, you know, they've called it Visual Studio here. So that makes it pretty clear. It's Visual Studio's idea of formatting. And if you want to use the latest and greatest Clang format, uh, well, I believe currently Clang is at version 13. So if you want to use the latest and greatest Clang format, or you've got custom formatting options that you've added to Clang format, so you need to run your particular Clang format executable, you can check this little box and then browse to a particular executable path. And that can be handy if your team has chosen to use Clang format, but an older version of Clang format, because sometimes as Clang format itself evolves, even though you're using only the old settings because you've got a settings file that's tailored for the old version of Clang format, even though you're using the old settings file, the defaults change or they add new policy that's not, and the new policy is covered by a default setting that's not mentioned in your Clang format file because your Clang format for file is targeting an older version of Clang format. So that's another scenario where you might want to use a custom executable. So that's nice that you can override that. Um, otherwise, these uh, settings, like I believe the default for this client format execution is to run client format for all formatting scenarios. Uh, 
And again, because these other options would normally be checked, it's pretty much good. Anytime it thinks it needs to format something, it's just going to run clang format on it. Um, it can run clang format on a selection, obviously, or you can run it on the whole file. You can just control A the whole file to select everything and reformat the entire file. It's also possible, if you wish, that you can, as we saw, you can invoke clang format from the command line. So if you want to do a batch processing of you know formatting your entire tree, instead of having to manually select those files inside Visual Studio, you can run Clang Format from the Visual Studio command prompt, and you can run it manually on uh, files in your tree. Now, for some Clang tools, they need a compilation database, which is basically a it's a little JSON file that matches up every source file with the command line used to build that source file. And the, re the reason some tools need that is, for instance, if it's a uh, code analysis tool like Clang Tidy, or the com or uh, when you when you use it as the compiler inside Visual Studio, it's just going to use the path to the compiler. But if you're using a tool like Clang Tidy, which basically acts like a compiler front end it needs to know which macros are defined what is the include search path and all that kind of stuff running those kinds of tools from the command line can be more tricky because you have to build that compile commands.json and um, there are a variety of tricks to be able to get that json file on windows but realistically it's it's just easier to invoke those tools from inside visual studio um, now, so that was Clang Tidy, that's, or sorry, that was Clang Format, that is, you know, how you can invoke Clang's tool for formatting source code in a consistent manner. And, um, my tastes are kind of esoteric because they've evolved over many years of editing C and C++ code. But Clang Format, even though my tastes are not, um, my tastes are my own developed over time as opposed to a corporate standard like you know the Google style guide or whatever I mean if, you, if you're just writing code for Google or for LLVM it's easy you just say use the LLVM style guide and format the code and then usually the reason you're doing that is because you're making a contribution to an open source project that is managed by Google or LLVM like maybe you're making a contribution to Clang Tidy itself and in those cases, the usually the source tree already has a Clang Format file committed to it. So you just need to run Clang Format. You don't need to supply any additional command line arguments. Um, that makes it easy. Um, developing your own set of options, as we saw back here, there are many options. But um, it's usually not too hard to just start with one of these style categories and work your way down through as you format the code and you notice it's not formatted the way you like like if something about curly brace placement or whatnot you just search through this web play web page of all the options looking for brace and you see you know here's brace wrapping you know and then you, what as you start to read through all these different options you start to realize you know there's a lot more corner cases to formatting code than you might have realized um, so maybe you rethink some of the things that you hadn't considered before about how to consistently format code. So that would be my recommendation if you're going to build a your own format settings file from the ground up. Start with a, a style that seems closest to what you already are using. And then as you notice that the formatting is off, go and adjust the settings one by one. Um, you could, of course, go through all the settings when you first create your settings file and, you know, adjust each one as you read through the documentation. Um, that's, you know, kind of a more completist approach, but, you know, personally, I don't find, you know, it's not the greatest way to spend time to tweaking all these definitions. I prefer to tweak the settings one by one as I encounter something that it isn't quite formatted correctly. And then you, and then in the end, you may find it can't format it exactly the way you like. For instance, me personally, 
I kind of like if I'm going to have a bunch of uh, slash slash comments, you know, describing things. Oops. Over here, I kind of like them to be lined up, but uh, Clang likes to. Hmm. It's not doing what I thought. I have a feeling it's not really running Clang format. But it has Clang has a tendency to line these up to the nearest like indent level instead of keeping them all lined up at a certain column. You know, kind of assembly programmer style wise, you like to have uh, your comments kind of starting in column forty and so they kind of reads like a parallel dialogue, the code on the left and the comments on the right. Whereas Clang likes to shift the comments over to the to hug them up against the statements so that the um, running commentary is now kind of got a jagged indent as opposed to a uh, consistent indent. Um, I'm not sure why it doesn't seem to be. Let's just double check that my key binding is doing what I'm thinking it's doing. Text editor, KF, edit format selection. Okay. And I've told it. Text editor, C++, code style, formatting. Run Clang formatting for manually invoked commands. At any rate, um, normally I use this at, in my work with a uh, particular Clang form at executable um, and haven't noticed any problems before, so I'm not sure why it's behaving a little fussy tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally not using that old, uh, the one we use at work is a Clang form at 3.8, which is really quite old, but it's what we've decided to use for our team. So... All right, let's continue. So, the next thing you might want to do is to use uh, Clang Tidy to find issues in your code. And you might have noticed here that I've got a little green squiggle. And down here in my error list, I've got this analysis from Clang Tidy that's saying I've got redundant Boolean literal in conditional return statement. What, what does that really mean? Well, the check is called readability simplify boolean expert. And if we click that link or if in the in the uh, error list there's a link for these different uh clang tidy check names and if we click that it brings us over to the documentation. Now it's bringing us to the top of tree documentation which is clang tools 13. Uh it should probably really bring us to clang tools 11 because that's the version in Visual Studio that we're using here. If we search down, I happen to know this particular check isn't any different, uh, except for a single, except for a bug fix. So it's showing you here that the point of this check is to simplify Boolean expressions. So instead of comparing a, a Boolean against true. You just test the boolean. Instead of testing if the boolean is equal to false, you just test if not boolean is true, and so on. And um, the one we're looking at here is this case. If we go back and look at our code, let's see, we are at. Oh, it well, was a little small. Okay. Uh, if we go back and look at our code, we're saying if condition return true, else return false. Well, we can just return this boolean condition directly because that's what this replacement is saying that instead of checking the condition and returning true else returning false we can just return whatever that boolean expression is directly so this could be simplified to we could just say return that's the equivalent code and it's it's more straightforward expression of what we're trying to do and now, in fact, even these parentheses are redundant as well. We could remove those out. Now, 
I mentioned earlier that we're talking about the support you can get in Visual Studio without buying anything extra. Now, uh, from previous talks, you know that I like to use ReSharper from JetBrains, which is a paid add-on. And the advantage of the paid add-on is that Clang Tidy, when you run this check, it can provide a so-called fix-it, which is that it, it can supply the replacement code in this result column for this particular check and for many other checks as well it can provide a the uh, simplification to the code in an automatic fashion so Clang Tidy can do that substitution that I've highlighted automatically if you run Clang Tidy from the command line and you have a suitable compilation command JSON file then you can perform this substitution in an automatic fashion you can do batch refactoring you can re apply a certain um, simplification or uh, one of these clang tidy checks to your entire tree and fix it everywhere. Now there's a minor asterisk there that I will cover in a moment. However, in Visual Studio what they've done is they have glued in clang tidy into their code analysis mechanism that they have for projects in Visual Studio. So in Visual Studio it can report if I revert this back, let's just get rid of these two. If I revert this back, it will run the code analysis again in the background, and the squiggle will eventually appear again here underneath the true. It does the analysis, but it doesn't yet have a means out of the box in Visual Studio to apply the, the change, which Clang Tidy calls it a fix it. But if you have ReSharper, you can invoke the fix it from ReSharper from a uh, shortcut directly in the editor. So while using the uh, free support in Visual Studio, you can get the benefit of the checks, you don't get the benefit of the automatic fix its, which is a bit of a bummer. They say they're working on it, but that's how things stand currently. So this stuff, uh, the Clang Tidy business is not on by default. So, and I mentioned they had it plugged in through the code analysis. So how does that work? Well, if you look at the project settings, project properties for a project, this in, in this case, this happens to be the main executable for this little fractal renderer. You see there's a code analysis option down here. And if we go down to this uh, code option, uh, if you're familiar with these property settings in Visual Studio, you'll notice that uh, options that are not the default are always shown in bold. So enable code analysis on build. The code analysis is basically an extra um, path over the abstract syntax tree that is created from the front end. So it, and it, the code analysis can be lengthy. So the code analysis on build is normally off. Um, I've turned Microsoft code analysis off because I just want to run Clang Tidy and I've turned uh, Clang Tidy on and uh, for the Microsoft code analysis what they've got is a, they've got rule sets and the rule sets uh, contain rules that perform each rule within the rule set performs a particular kind of check, either some kind of static analysis check. And you'll notice that a lot of them are the C++ core checks. And if you're familiar with the um, C++ guidelines that are being created, if we just go back over here, C++ guidelines. C++ core guidelines. So this set of guidelines have been coming together for a number of years underneath the uh, editorial control of Bjorn Straustrup and Herb Sutter. And the, it's quite lengthy. I mean, like if, you, if we start scrolling through this, you see there's tons of stuff. And they've grouped them into ver a variety of categories. So um, guidelines around the philosophy of how your code should be structured, interfaces, guidelines for functions, guidelines for classes and class hierarchies, guidelines for enums, and so on. 
So if we go back to Visual Studio, their code analysis, they've got different core check rules for guidelines that can be um, detected automatically. So guidelines that can be detected by some kind of parsing tool and it can um, do some kind of analysis and say like, hey, you know, according, if you're going to follow those guidelines, this piece of code does not follow the recommendation. So to make this uh, build a little bit more tractable, I, I turned on the code analysis at build, but I turned off the Microsoft analysis because I didn't want to run all these uh, rules. Not, there's nothing wrong with running these rules. It's just that it takes a while to run all of them. Um, the default here, I believe, is the Microsoft native recommended rules. And for Clang Tidy, you can supply basically the command line argument that would be passed to dash dash checks for Clang Tidy. And if we go back over here to Clang Tidy, basically, you see here on their examples, they're supplying dash checks as a filter list and it if you have a, a dash before a wildcard it is subtracting and then if you have a a wildcard without a dash in front it is adding so it acts like a a blacklist and then a whitelist and this allows you to do things like say um, turn on all the checks or just turn on the Clang Analyzer checks. These are the checks that come from the static analyzer that is built into Clang. Uh, normally when you compile with Clang, the static analyzer is not turned on because again, it's like Microsoft Static Analyzer. It, it does a significant amount of additional work, but it is uh, a good way to find problems in your code that are hiding in there. Uh, there's a bunch of these checks in here that are good, but um, you don't necessarily want to get all of them. If you if you try to turn them all on, you're just going to be overwhelmed with um, too many things at once. So my recommendation is to kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with these checks. Um, on a first pass, it's fairly easy to ignore the ones that begin with some kind of project name. These are Clang Tidy checks that are specific to that particular project. The Absale project is a open source library from Google that is kind of a foundational library that is used to sit underneath a lot of other things that Google builds on top. But if you're not using Absale, then you can just ignore those. If Again, if, if you're not using Android, you can ignore those. The ones that are more interesting are these bug prone checks. Uh, obviously, there's a number of them and we'll go through them all. Um, the cert checks are from the um, can't remember what cert stands for. Um, Wikipedia will tell me. It is the Computer Emergency Response Team. So the cert checks revolve around recommendations for C and C++ code that come from analyzing security vulnerabilities. So that's another good set of checks. The Clang Analyzer checks, there's not too many of them. You notice a bunch of them are specific to OS X. They're um, reasonable to turn on. Um, and there's, again, you see some of the CPP core guidelines have been implemented as Clang Tidy checks. Uh, there's a bunch that come from Google. Um, the MISC category is kind of hit or miss. Uh, be careful which ones you pick and uh, which ones you don't pick. The modernized checks, of which there are quite a number, are interesting because you may have a legacy code base and you want to bring that code base into more conformance with modern C++ coding idioms, but you don't want to manually edit the code yourself. So um, within the modernized group, just take a look at uh, loop convert. Loop convert is a check that can convert loops that walk over iterators into a range for loop. 
which is much simpler to read and much easier to understand. The compiler is doing syntactic sugar underneath the covers and turning it into a loop using iterators anyway. So there's no difference in efficiency, but you get um, better understanding from just reading a range for loop than you do from reading a loop that's manipulating and comparing iter iterators. And with Clang Tidy, you can modernize those loops uh, in an automated fashion. There's also, uh, excuse me, use auto, use bool literals, and so on. Uh, use null pointer is another one that would be uh, good to run over your code base to get uh, replace usage of zero or the null macro with the null putter keyword. Uh, there are some performance related checks. These are mostly things like um, they recognize certain idioms and there's a faster way to do it by using a standard algorithm or by using um, some other variation that results in fewer copies and therefore it's the, got the same semantics but it's more efficient because there's less copying of data going on. There's a bunch that revolve around readability. We looked at the one that was simplified Boolean expression. Um, redundant use of cstr is another one. You've got a function that takes a standard string by reference, but it used to take a care star. And so because you have legacy code that is expecting to pass in a care star, it is calling cstr on your std string locals or parameters before you pass it into this function. But now the function has been switched to take it by a stud string. So now you've got a weird situation where you make a C style string and then the first thing the compiler does is create a std string temporary from that C style string. And the C style string came from a std string in the first place. So you've got a std string converted to a C style string and then converted into a std string temporary to satisfy the calling function. So um, looking for that kind of stuff can if you've, if you've got a code base that's evolved and it's large enough that you haven't been able to manually track the changes and signatures of all these functions of, of the string data that's being passed around, running that on your code base could improve the efficiency of your code and performance of your code and make things better. So from Visual Studio, using their code analysis mechanism, we can get any particular clang tidy check that we want. If we wanted to have multiple uh, modernized loop convert, if convert, if we wanted multiple checks, you can just put uh, commas on there and we can go over here to a particular source file and we can say analyze, run code analysis on file, and you see that what it really does is a build. And um, you'll see that even though I'm building just this one file, because it's doing the code analysis as well, it takes significantly longer than just building the file. So having the code analysis on every time you build is probably not desirable because it just makes your builds take too long. And we already don't like builds taking a long time. Now in this case, Uh, why did I lose the output? These should have shown up in the warnings when errors window. There it is. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, in this particular code base, uh, it's old enough that it wasn't even using iterators, and I've already run um, Clang Tidy on it previously, so the only reason it it found this one is because this is a piece of example code that I just typed in here to show you how that works. So we didn't turn up any new warnings. Um, it's interesting that this diagnostic, I mean, it's on by default. If we look at my settings for code analysis, I was accepting all the default checks and adding ones. If I didn't want this Clang diagnostic missing braces, I would have to say minus star first to turn off all checks that are on by default before applying the checks I was interested in. Um, and if you're just doing a focused inspection of your code or a focused analysis of these checks, 
uh, that might be the best way to go to say minus star and then add on just the one you're interested in to save time executing the default set of checks it's the set of default checks is not a huge list but any time you can save and getting the analysis done is going to be good so the next thing that you would be interested in is using the Clang compiler as the front-end compiler and that is also accessible from the project properties if you um, go to the general configuration properties you see here that the platform tool set that I'm using is Visual Studio 2019 v142 that's the particular compiler that I'm using and you'll notice down here there's another choice called Clang CL and if I choose that <coughs> I can rebuild this code you notice it's shown it as a project setting just for this one project I didn't change all the projects it just changed this one if I choose uh, let me do this let me turn off the code analysis so we can get a faster build turn this off I believe the default is off okay so if I rebuild this project it's now gonna build my code with the clang front end now why would you want to do that the Visual Studio compiler has gotten much better at supporting the current standard but there are still some uh, syntactic idiosyncrasies um, I believe they the last major one that they resolved was um, two-phase instantiation of templates that resolved a discrepancy between uh, behavior mandated by the standard and behavior that was coming from MSVC and you may decide for portability reasons that you just want to build all your code across all platforms with the same front end so using Clang CL you can do that Clang CL in this case is acting as the front end but the uh, back end code optimization is all being done by uh, the, the same Microsoft tool chain is my understanding so you don't need to worry about object files being generated from this process or static libraries or shared objects DLLs being generated from this project process having some kind of inconsistency with other object files or libraries or DLLs uh, compiled by MSVC everything will link together um, this code I've obviously not made it clean for all these uh, deprecated CRT functions so I got lots of warnings about that so if we look over here it's apparently gonna take a while for that to populate oh IntelliSense only let's try this build plus IntelliSense there we go so I got a lot of messages let's see if we can find one that was specific to Clang ah uh, nope um well actually this is specific to Clang if we look at this you notice here it's saying dash W missing braces that looks suspiciously like a warning argument that you would give to GCC now Clang CL is a Clang front end and the reason it's called Clang dash CL uh, if you're familiar with Microsoft's executable names CL.exe is the compiler for C and C++ from that ships with Visual Studio Clang dash CL is a front end that understands all of the Microsoft command line options in addition to the options that you could pass to GCC so it's kind of a, a, an interesting beast from the command line option perspective which is why the diagnostic here is saying dash W missing dash braces that's because there's not really any equivalent command line option for MSVC to give you a warning about this scenario uh, the scenario here is that 
I've got uh, a three-dimensional array and I've got a single initializer what this should be is it's recommending that I put braces around the initializers of sub objects because this is treated as an array of arrays of sub object of, of ints array of arrays of ints so it wants to see braces around the nested arrays um, it's not technically required that's why it's just a warning um, and then you see the normal you know use of scanf is deprecated blah 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 um, and but notice here the command line option they're mentioning in the message is you know w deprecated declarations um, instead of directing you to that it, it's clear that we're using a Clang compiler because the diagnostics are coming out in a Clang format not an MSVC style there's no like uh, C9649 code for the warning message or the error message that's coming out of the compiler front end so why would you want to do that why would you want to use Clang CL as your front end instead of the MSVC front end well again maybe compatibility maybe the Clang 11 is implemented some features from the current standard that aren't yet appearing in MSVC and you want to use those features and you don't want to have to work around it in your source code you just want to have a consistent compiler front end to handle the same feature level so you could do that with Clang CL also maybe you are using some GNU or Clang extensions that um, only affect the front end portion of the compilation phase so again you could use Clang CL on Windows to compile your code from inside Visual Studio to support those extensions as long as it doesn't uh, depend on custom backend changes because the backend is still um, the Microsoft code generator backend we're just talking about changes related to the front end things like um, an extension you might want to use is uh, named field initializers for structs that is a standard part of current C but it is not a standard part of current C++ but GCC and Clang I believe both support that as an extension it is clearly or, or um, it is limited rather to just the front end um, in terms of the parsing of the code that is done I believe I'm not 100% certain on that so I might I might be wrong on that particular extension but that's just an example of something that is supported by those compilers that isn't supported by MSVC so um, you can do these things from the uh, property settings on a project now how you get at some of these settings from uh, CMake is not entirely clear in particular this this code analysis section you notice that when we look at the the online help for these options it doesn't show a command line argument that says this is how you do it from the command line so it's unclear to me if the code analysis portions can be accessed from the command line which is what you have access to from CMake um, however selecting the tool chain that is accessible from CMake when you generate your project configuration you can supply the tool set to be used and the value that you supply is this value in parentheses so if you wanted to use a uh, for instance for some reason you might be restricted to using the 2017 compiler but you want to use the 2019 IDE because the editor has a lot of improvements so from CMake you can generate a Visual Studio 2019 project and solution but you can tell it to use the 140 V141 compiler and that would be using the 2017 compiler or maybe you even need to go back to the 2015 compiler so if you needed or if you wanted from CMake to specify that you want to use Clang CL as the front end uh, and it's solution wide it's because it's at CMake configuration time 
you can supply that um, as an argument to CMake on the command line and there's also a option box in the CMake GUI to set it from there. So that covers three major components from Clang that you can use directly from inside Visual Studio. Clang Format for formatting your code. Clang Tidy for performing additional checks on your code beyond a Microsoft's built-in code analysis. And that's not to say that their built-in code analysis is bad. It's just different. What you find with static analysis, and we've discussed this before, probably a couple years ago at this point, is that when it comes to static analysis tools, you want to use as many of them as you can because they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. So Clang Tidy can point out things that Visual Studio's static analysis can't find. And if you invoke Clang Tidy from the command line, you can apply the automatic fixits. Now I mentioned there was this compilation database, JSON. There is a free extension that you can get from um, Visual Studio's online store. So over in, uh, I think it's Manage Extensions. You can get from the Visual Studio Marketplace. Um, there's a there's a free extension that you can get that will analyze your project and generate the compile commands.json if you want to run Clang Tidy in batch mode. It takes a while to populate this. We'll just cancel that. Um, so there is an option for doing that if you want to run Clang Tidy to be able to apply the fixits in batch mode uh, without having to manually create that JSON file yourself, which is for any significant size code base is not something you want to do. I mean, it's conceivable you could, but it's uh, a lot of typing. You wouldn't want to have to do it by hand. For a small project, one or two files, probably reasonable. Um, there is also a way to invoke Clang format on a particular file and just supply command line arguments to the compiler macros to be defined, include directories to search, and so on. So if you have a very small project, you don't necessarily have to create a compile commands JSON. But for anything beyond one or two files, you're going to want to create that. Um, so if you use the batch format or a batch invocation of Clang Tidy with a com uh, compile commands JSON, then uh, if you do that from the Visual Studio developer command prompt, you can then apply the fixits in an automated fashion. Now the reason that they made Clang format in the first place was not only to make it easy to have their source code formatted in a consistent fashion, but as they started working on refactoring tools like Clang Tidy, they started noticing that although the code was syntactically correct, after you do these substitutions, the code is, you know, needs to be reformatted anyway. So it's very common to run Clang Tidy to apply some automatic fixes. And then the next thing you do is run Clang format on the, all the files that were modified to get them formatted back in a consistent fashion. Because um, it's just it, the, the vagaries of, of the different formatting decisions after you change the source code in a programmatic way are just so variable that it's better to have two tools that are good at one thing each. And then finally, we saw how to switch your front end to being compiled with Clang, which you may want to do for compatibility purposes between platforms, gain access to specific extensions, or maybe you just like the diagnostics from Clang. You maybe like the diagnostics better. You don't. You, you, sometimes Clang's diagnostics are uh, more clear in that they they point you at the source of the problem rather than the ultimate failure that resulted from the source of the problem. Um, there are all, there's also a third-party extension. It's not built into Visual Studio, but it is free. That will let you run Clang Tidy on your source code. So if you are on older versions of Visual Studio that don't have Clang Tidy integrated, so Visual Studio 2015, for instance, that is an option as well. But I, tonight, I just wanted to cover the things that are built into Visual Studio 2019 
that she can use out of the box without having to go anywhere else for additional things. And that about wraps it up. So if we got any questions, we can go to those. Yeah, so the process of uh, running Kling format, is that something you'd recommend doing like on an automated Jenkins job or something? I guess same question for Kling Tidy. Um, so it's a good it's a good question. I'd say this is one you need to really decide among your team. I mean, if it, if it's just me on my own project, I run Clang format every time I modify files before I push them into version control. Um, I run Clang tidy and a continuous integration job to alert myself of any kind of um, issues that I may have introduced without realizing it, and I I start with a very small list of checks and I as I fix the issues that more you know as I turn on more checks I fix the issues so that once it's turned on in the continuous integration build it builds clean and then I get a failure if I accidentally introduce another instance of like not using null pointer or whatever okay uh, the the formatting issue it really can ignite a huge firestorm in your team if you come down too heavy on the hammer with it. Um, there's just so much personal choice in that discussion that uh, even when you reach agreement, if it's n if you reach agreement on the style and then you run it on the whole tree, invariably is the code is just going to drift. So you have to have some way to automatically reformat it and keep it all consistent. Either that or you have to carve out time to say like every two weeks we're going to manually do it and, and commit all the diffs and then you've got people complaining that you're making these big diffs and it's just all white space changes and why are you doing that? And so I have to rebase my whole change list on top of it and now I got all these conflicts I need to resolve. I mean, it, it's a huge can of worms. Both It's got pluses and minuses. Um my recommendation is that if you're on a team of any significant size that you if you're gonna mandate formatting of the code according to a clang tidy specification sorry clang format specification introduce something so that the code is automatically formatted as frequently as possible so that the drift is minimized otherwise whenever you try to synchronize it back up it's you know a giant bank holiday for everybody they all got to coordinate around it and it's you know you're you, so you, it's hard to gain the benefits of consistent formatting if you're not enforcing it in some fashion yeah makes sense any other questions uh, i guess there are cases where the code may compile with the visual studio tools but it might not compile with Kling. Uh, I guess that's something you'd have to watch out for. That's actually um, a good reason to compile the code with both. So if you're so let's just for discussion's sake say your product is Windows only or your project if it's maybe it's open source is Windows only um, but compiling with both front ends in a continuous integration job can keep you away from extensions that are compiler specific and um, you know kind of give you an incentive to write code that is portable uh, because the worst thing that can happen is like somebody comes along and says holy crap we got this huge opportunity but we need to get the code running on Linux and you've never built it on Linux before and then you spend like a week fixing issues in your code that you didn't even realize they were there because they were uh, either things where MSVC was too lax or too strict. So it can be good to keep your code compiling on multiple platforms even if delivering on multiple platforms isn't a requirement. And right. Clang uh, CL and as a front end can be a good way to achieve that even though you're not actually building on Linux. Yeah, and I guess if it doesn't compile with Kling, then Kling Tidy may not work either. Um, 
Clang Tidy on Windows, I believe, uses the Clang CL front end. And the Clang CL front end is designed to be as compatible with MSVC as possible. So I believe um, it, while it won't accept syntactically incorrect code, it recognizes MSVC-isms, if you will. Okay. Good to know. They, they try to, they've worked really hard to make Clang CL a drop-in replacement for MSVC. But there are, um, if you go to the Visual Studio, um, it's either Visual Studio or Visual C++ blog, where they talk about the introduction of Clang CL front end and how you access it from Visual Studio. They go through a couple of these scenarios where MSVC was either too lax or too strict and how you um, would adjust the code so that it works on both. Usually it's a case of MX, MSVC being too lax, meaning um, the standard technically might require like the type name keyword to be present, for instance, but MSVC would allow you to get by without the type name keyword and would you know do the right thing. But you try to take that code over to GCC or Clang and it says missing type name keyword. You know, so those sorts of things and that's usually the case where they diverge. It's MSVC being too lax. Um, and th there are some issues with MSVC where in the past it wasn't entirely conformant with the standard. Um, but I believe they've corrected all of those by now at, at this point. Uh, when, they got, when they fixed the last one of two-phase template instantiation, which to summarize, the problem is there could be templates in MSVC where it would bind the tokens in the template too early and then when the template was instantiated the tokens were bound to the technically to the wrong thing and while it's um, not trivial to reproduce that error it, if you're a meta programmer creating a template library it's gonna come up it's it's not hard to come up with if you're doing lots of template oriented work um, but it's obviously not affecting the vast majority of developers so they would have fixed it earlier um, but it has been fixed now that was one that they needed to do some serious work on the um, tokenizing of template declarations because uh, what they were doing before was turning it into a stream of tokens that would get injected at the time the template was instantiated and they they needed to do something different so it, it was a change that required a fairly significant modification to the parser in order to get it to be correct so that's why it took them a long time but that's the last big hurdle that I'm aware of uh, that was breaking standardization um, I believe that was one of the reasons why the ranges library for a long time didn't compile on MSVC correctly. It's because it was the ranges library is a heavy templated based library and it was using some of this machinery that wasn't working correctly in MSVC. And Eric Niebler, who was maintaining that library, just wanted to uh, not worry about workarounds for older compilers. He just wanted to target C17 and use, uh, assume C++17 as a baseline. But that should be corrected by now. Any other questions? Okay, then we will end it there.